So now we'll move on to the startup section. It's no better time than now for a startup in VLSI, in my view. And, and very good plant or a seed needs the nutrition, which I consider it as coming from the academia, where they create the great technical young minds with the right fundamentals. And the plant needs good amount of grooming with the fertilizers, right? I consider today this industry is coming forward with a nice incubation programs in terms of funding and technical advisory. The last but not the least, you need a greater environment for your plan to foster. So governments are coming up with and nice policies and supportive environment to foster in such a healthy global market for the startups. And specifically, VLSAID 2022, is really proud to be the platform to bring in that the government bodies represented by honorable minister from the state and the center and the industry veterans and the great academicians and to be a catalyst to foster this innovation. At this juncture, I wanted to convey my sincere thanks to our VLSID 2020 startup chairs, Mr. Neil Bhatia from Intel, Mr. Bharat Rangarajan and Jens Anderson from Motivo and Anshul Sharma from Samsung and Swapna Gupta from Qualcomm. I always remember this word from CEO of Intel, Mr. Pat Gelsinger. Technology is a magic. Semiconductor is heart of every technology. The products in India creates the growth and demand for semiconductors and paving the path for semiconductor nation, which is our vision today as mentioned by Dr. Satya Gupta, the president of VLSA Society of India. That said, we have exciting startups who's going to create a potential opportunity, not only for the semiconductors, right, for the exciting young talents. With that note, I wanted to give a glimpse of today's startup of the day. The first one being the 5G challenges in the, in the satellite communication. If I have to just summarize that, a 3G made a smartphone, a phone smarter. A 4G made a laptop smarter by untying your LAN cable away from it. The 5G, I'm kind of really super excited to see what it is going to bring in the world of autonomous driving, metaverse, and the industrial revolution. And we have a representative from Astrom talking about it. What if I just put in 5G in the drones? Oh. That's incredible. But I've already witnessed in our 75th Republic Day, right? What a uh, visual treat was that. We're going to have a representative from BotLab Dynamics talking about those drones. Is not drone and with an enabled 5G good enough? Probably not. You need to have a semiconductor chip under it, which needs to have an EMA compliance, isn't it? So we need to have and tools like compliance code which makes sure that your, e, your EMA compliant right from the beginning of the design. And we will have a representative from Simyok talking about it. When you go for gigascale or a mega scale production, you need and beyond human eyes and the lightning speed of screening every part, right? You cannot let go your default part in your customer's hands. We will have six cents AI representative talking about the innovations around, the, around that space. With that introduction of all the startups, I wanted to talk about, I want to give a quick overview about Astrom. Astrom is focused on delivering GigaMess, a multi-gigabit wireless backhaul radio for 4G, 5G telecom market, and GigaSat, an innovative Q, Q and Cobb and electronically steerable antenna for SATCOM market. GigaMess works in EBAN and has unique features of creating multiple p 2 links from one device where each link is electronically steerable. Gigamess pilots are being conducted with partners and customers, which includes Indian Defense. Astrom will be lodging GigaSat, an electronically steerable SATCOM terminal suitable for communicating with multiple geos and LEO satellites by 2022. With that, it's my honor to introduce Nega Satak, who is CEO and founder of Astrom Technologies. She's a serial entrepreneur with over 15 years of experience, and she holds PhD from Texas A&M University 
and Masters in Aerospace from IASC Bangalore. Priya to Astrom, she co-founded two space companies, Space IOM, a non-profit company promoting hands-on education by organizing international conferences and ECAPs, which received a $1 million grant to develop asteroid deflection technology. She's a recipient of a number of awards and grants, including Amela Ahad Fellowship and W.E. Key Fellow. She is also one of the two Indian women to win the prestigious Kahneman Fellowship for Space Tech Innovators in this year. With its introduction, all stage is all yours, Neha. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Dhanapati. Uh, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would like to you know, thank the organizers for you know, giving us this opportunity to present today at this forum. Um, uh, I will, you know, share my screen to run you guys through uh, a presentation, which uh, basically will talk about what Astrom does and uh, the product that uh, we just heard uh, about. So uh, we are a deep tech startup and, uh, you know, we have developed, uh, you know, products which basically, you know, help or will, will help India and the world to connect better. So, you know, during this pandemic, we all have realized that connectivity is not just, a, a, you know, a good to have, but it's actually a necessity. And we need to have connectivity, good connectivity, not just in cities, but also in rural areas. Um, and also our defense forces need to be connected uh, well. Um, so to accomplish all of that, we have to really, as a world, develop really cool wireless technologies which can be deployed fast and they can uh, be uh, also very cost effective in deploying, you know, and they can be a complementary technology to fiber, you know, for us to get connected better and faster. Um, so Astrom, uh, you know, has developed one such radio called Giga Mesh. Um, and it's, it's basically a really, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, amazing technology, which we have also patented. Um, because, uh, first of all, it's the world's first multi-beam E-band radio. So uh, E-band means, um, you know, very high frequency, 71 to 76 gigahertz and 81 to 86 gigahertz. So the general trend, um, you know, in the wireless industry is to move to higher and higher frequencies because there is a lot of bandwidth available um, and to have products which can work uh, in gigabit speeds. So how can we, you know, so that's kind of the challenge that we are solving with this product. A little bit about the company before I get into the details. Uh, the company was founded by uh, two tech founders, including me. Uh, both of us are PhDs. Um, we are a VC-backed uh, company with presence in India and US. Uh, the product that I will be talking about today has won several awards. The most prestigious award being and uh, by the International Telecommunication Union, who is an authority uh, in the field of uh, infrastructure, telecom infrastructure, um, for being the most uh, promising connectivity solution. Um, uh, we are a dedicated team of, uh, you know, 34 plus, uh, you know, employees here in Bangalore, and we are expanding to US now. Uh, we do, we are actually in the hiring mode. So any of you listening to this presentation uh, at the end of it, if you feel connected with our course, please do, you know, go to our website and uh, look at the open positions. Um, so the leadership team, uh, you know, just quickly, you know, going through So two of us are the co-founders. And then we also have very experienced business leaders, uh, as well as great engineers who are um, actually the, the, you know, cream of engineering talent in India. Um, and the problem that we are solving is very simple. Uh, you know, um, if you look at telecom uh, infrastructure around you, there is great infrastructure wherever there is fiber. But once you move away from the fiber, you know, even in suburban areas or rural areas, uh, the kind of connectivity that you uh, get is really not adequate. Uh, and the reason for that is today we use wireless, uh, you know, uh, connectivity solutions uh, backhaul solutions which are uh, not providing adequate bandwidth and this problem is only going to intensify when you are deploying 5g um, and uh, you know the only solution is to have wireless equipments which can actually give you gigabit speeds or even higher uh, but at a uh, you know good price point because 
uh, the telecom infrastructure needs to be a you know profit making uh, you know uh, industry so for that cost is a very very important aspect um and all the current devices available in the market uh, in the higher frequency bands either do not provide the capacity or they are very dif difficult to deploy and maintain so we solve both of those problems by our innovative uh, you know wireless product called gigamesh uh, it is the world's first multi beam e band radio so basically it can do the job of multiple fiber um, you know uh, uh, strands Uh, to connect one tower which is connected with fiber to multiple towers which are not connected with fiber the great thing about this product is that uh, first of all it is scalable in capacity which means that it can deliver from 1 gbps speeds to potentially even 100 gbps kind of speeds in the future versions um and the second thing is it can also scale in terms of range so it can work in urban areas where you need shorter ranges higher capacity and also for rural areas where you need longer range up to 10 kilometers kind of range um and maybe gigabit speeds uh, so so the product is a very very scalable uh, product and uh, you know the amazing thing about this product is that it's completely software driven uh, and that's one of the things that we've learned over the years that you know uh, if you have things you know controlled in software managed in software Uh, the whole opex cost really comes down quite a bit and so that's what is also true for this product it can uh, basically bring down the opex cost by a large amount um and uh, you know help operators reduce the opex cost of maintaining backhaul infrastructure by even about 30% so so this kind of a product can help slash opex cost by about 1/6 and uh, cap uh, sorry capex cost by about 1/6 as compared to fiber and about 30% as compared to you know uh, fiber again in the opex um so these are you know uh, the, you know we already have a product called gigamesh pathway which is launched in the market it is being uh, you know trialed uh, all over the world uh, which can give you a 10 km range 2 gbps uh, per link and up to four links and this product is suitable for 5g backhaul rural broadband uh defense and for private networks for uh, enterprise connectivity uh the next version of the product uh will actually scale this up further to address more markets like 5g mid hall uh, and uh, front hall and it will also scale the capacity that will be available uh, per link um so uh, you know the main value proposition that we are bringing to the table is that we will help telecom operators uh deploy uh rural broadband infrastructure 5g infrastructure faster and to that uh you know with our innovative technology which utilizes higher frequencies uh spectrum as well as very innovative software driven technology uh which makes it possible for it to reduce the opex cost as well apart from the capex um so in terms of the market verticals that this product uh, can uh, you know uh, is actually addressing first of all defense communication is um, uh, you know a, a market which actually uh, we have identified early on we have been identified and uh, you know we are working with indian defense forces to deploy this product um, in the network we are also winners of idex challenges which is uh, by ministry of defense um and we are also winners of uh, you know um 5g hackathon as well as dc uh, dcis grant from department of telecommunication because this product is absolutely necessary this kind of products are absolutely necessary for deploying the next generation 5g telecom networks uh, because without the backbone of the network um, even if you have the greatest 5g um radio on the tower it will not help you know for you to get the kind of speeds that you're expecting from 5g uh rural broadband is a very big uh, you know market for us um because um as you know uh, you know uh uh every country including you know developed countries need to work on their rural broadband infrastructure uh, uh because there is not enough capacity and there's not enough uh capacity available at the right price points you know uh in the rural areas not just for developing countries but also for developed countries and uh, last but not the least uh, the enterprise and private networks are another market that we are addressing with this product um you know in the future there will be a lot of 
um you know there will be a trend of um, actually enterprises wanting to build their own high speed networks um you know in their campuses and even across campuses so that's something that we address with this product as well um so i think uh, i may be running out of time but i will just quickly say that this product uh, you know um you know goes into a, a various different kind of networks and it is used for tower to tower connectivity um it uh, complements fiber to provide uh, gigabit speeds at uh, you know a very good cost um and it uh, help it, it will help to deploy 5g networks as well as rural broadband networks so with that uh, you know i'll just pull up my last slide which is the partner ecosystem so we've been able to uh, have you know uh, good partners great partners which have helped us scale up to this level and we hope to make more partnerships in the future um so with that thank you so much for your attention th th thank you very much uh, neha this was, was like you know a uh, excellent uh, you know talk about it. the 5g is the next big thing right so i have a question to you so uh, that the biggest problem in the 5g or the millimeter wave is that you know the penetration right uh, so how are you uh, you know you and your startup is solving that problem for that ecosystem that currently is facing across i uh, guess uh, so when we talk about millimeter wave in 5g uh, most of the times we are talking about the access part which is how does a millimeter wave radio on a cell phone tower connects to your cell phone so i just want to clarify that we are not into that part we are into tower to tower connectivity so um, that being said the way we are actually addressing the um, you know the fundamental um you know uh, uh, problem that one hears when we, you hear about millimeter wave is that there is a lot of atmospheric attenuation so how do you compensate for that now um at different frequencies there are different levels of attenuations that the atmosphere you know uh, you know uh, poses on the frequency uh, signal uh, and at e band frequencies uh, you know fortunately there is no oxygen absorption there is rain attenuation uh but we compensate for that by uh basically making very very highly directional links so we do tower to tower communication with very very directional links so the antenna gain is really high which helps us basically overcome all of these uh you know weather condition related phenomena uh and still deliver gigabit speeds um to Uh, the towers so i hope that answers your question yes yes indeed indeed so um maybe i have a uh, generic broad based uh, question i think uh, there is a lot of entrepreneurs and then like you know the students over here and the research is looking at it you are one of the very successful uh, you know the startup person and the senior entrepreneurship if you wanted to give one single advice to them what would that be which will be helpful for them to groom their uh, you know startup um yes um so from an advice point of view i would say that first of all uh, you know have a lot of patience you know um and uh, be quick to change with the market so that's one thing that i think we have learned over the years that the market is always changing and with all the things that are happening all around us uh, we have to first of all stay true to what we believe in and at the same time uh basically you know uh, you know mold ourselves based on the market demand so that's kind of uh the advice that i would give thank you very much thank you nega much appreciate your time and sharing your views and wish you uh, all the good luck and you have lot of uh, you know launches uh, coming along the way in 2022 i think I wish you great success in your entrepreneurial journey okay so uh, with that note uh, we will uh, move on to our next startup of the day which is sport lab dynamics right flying in hundreds of drones simultaneously while controlling their flying pattern through a signal so single software platform is really a technical challenge right it's technological challenge but sport lab dynamics have, i would say kind of to an extent cracked it out by handling thousands of drones simultaneously right and and they have made a 3d formation in the sky right during uh, you know at rashtrapati bhavan on jan 29 2020 i think i have witnessed it i hope you would have all witnessed it right to achieve this goal what lab team have put together all necessary components hardware and software right 
such as the flight controllers, right? Precision GPS, mot motor controller, the ground control stations, algorithms, etc., in house, right? With these innovations, Woodlock ha has able to reduce the cost of this technology by one third. Some of the key commercial applications of this technology are media, entertainment, and as well as for the the light shows. Importantly, on the defense sector too, right? So with that note, I would like to introduce you all, Mr. Tane Ankar. He had completed his uh, B.Tech in engineering in 2016. Early in 2012, Tanai have took his first UAV flight. And by 2014, his team were asked to deliver eight drones right, that would join and Delhi police. This affirmed the faith of the drone technology and future in India. And eventually in 2016, he co-founded an organization called Boat Lab Dynamics. And he incorporated the you know, technology of the drones that he have developed. Right? And in the same year, right, the boat dynamics have sold heavy lift systems to Indian Agriculture and Research Institute. From there, rest is all history. With that introduction, over to you, oh, Tanmay. It's all, uh, I mean, stage is all yours. Thank you, Mr. Krishnamurthy, for the wonderful introduction. Uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to uh, showcase our work today. Uh, for those of you who have not seen uh, the drone show, I have uh, a clip, a small clip, from uh, our test that we conducted at Rashpati Bhavan. So what you see on uh, your screen, hopefully, uh, is the takeoff sequence of 1,000 drones. So we were asked to basically place all of the drones and uh, take off the and recover them in less than one hour. So we did a lot of practice. Uh, the visuals you see on your screen is from one of our calibration flights. So we used to go to Rashpati Bhavan in the morning and then we used to be there till uh, 10 p.m. late at night. And uh, this is from one of those trials. So it took us about 14 flights to calibrate our systems. And what you see on your screen right now is uh, the drones are getting repositioned to form a, a shape uh, that resembles a globe. And we were able to place all of the drones very precisely uh, within a few centimeters of uh, where they're supposed to be. And uh, the wonderful part was that we were also able to rotate this tree uh, structure. So you, you get the effect of uh, a, a, a 3D uh, static system, but it's also it's rigid and also rotating. So this was a big technical challenge, and uh, we took up this challenge uh, about six months before that. So uh, the, a team from Ministry of Defense uh, came to us and they asked if uh, we can uh, demonstrate. Uh, 1,000 systems on beating retreat. Now, at that point, we had only 50 systems. Uh, and we took up the challenge and the, uh, the core technology was there. Uh, we just had to learn how to scale these things up really quickly. And I'm just going to give you an overview of uh, what is the core technology that we have developed and uh, what are the roadblocks we faced. So uh, just a brief introduction, we have been working on uh, uh, swarming uh, from the very start of uh, Bot Lab. We realized very quickly that uh, scaling up these systems will become difficult and it, it uh, becomes less and less uh, uh, a technological challenge and more of a uh, logistics challenge where you get in bigger parts, bigger motors, and you just keep integrating these uh, systems to provide a solution, but there isn't much value add that you do. We realize that the, mo the most expensive part of a drone is the flight controllers and all the associated electronics that makes it function as a drone. So what you see on the screen is uh, from our very first demonstration of a swarm of 10 drones, we demonstrated this to the army. Uh, back in 2019. We were the first group in India to have demonstrated a fleet of 10 drones flying together from a single ground control station. And uh, having 
having the uh, task allocation uh, built within the logic of the system so basically these drones talk to each other and if let's say any one of them uh, has a malfunction or has uh, its payload depleted it can assign its task to the other one so uh, the the initial technology was uh, very deep we was uh, we were working with networking the drone itself and all of this has to be lightweight so it can fly I'm trouble to change my slides. Yeah. So we have demonstrated our tech to almost every uh, military base in India. We have gone to the northeast. We went to Tawang. We went to Sri Ganga Nagar. We have gone to Udhampur as well. But uh, we realized that we'll have to find a commercial application because defense takes time and defense uh, hardware also takes time to mature. During this time, we realized that uh, these drone shows were becoming very, very popular, and Intel was the pioneer in this. But again, the technology was very, very expensive, and uh, we had to come up with indigenous solutions so we can control the cost, and then build the associated software that will enable a drone show to happen. So when we started, we were starting with off the shelf components now a single gps that uh, we used to get from uh, a us company used to cost us around uh, 40000 rupees now if you scale uh, with that kind of solution it it becomes very very prohibitive in terms of cost so we realized that we'll have to make our own we'll have to start uh, from scratch and then get components and uh, we we knew how the controls of this thing work we just needed some hardware to run our logic so we started with uh, the motor controller so hopefully on the screen if you can see uh, this is uh, about 2 years old when we made our first motor controller this is a small 100 watt motor and we were able to spin the motor and that was uh, good enough so that was the very first thing that we realized that yes we can control the motor and we can uh, that's Dr. Sarita in the world. Okay. Once you have the motor controllers, you then move on to the flight controller. Uh, the On your screen, you'll see a flight controller. This is uh, the very first gen that we, uh, we, we just coupled a motion sensor along with uh, a microcontroller, and we tried porting our logic onto the mic microcontroller. Uh, hope, and this particular system was not... Uh, can not only uh, be used on the small drones that we demonstrated on beating the tweet, it can be used on bigger systems. So the same flight controller is flying uh, a drone which is uh, 3 kg, so 10 times the weight of the system that we flew on beating the tree. And able to demonstrate that uh, uh, the flight is stable, the flight controller can be used on uh, different categories of these. The most challenging part of uh, electronics was the GPS because the GPS has to be very precise. Now, we have built our own GPS. It's a quad band uh, GPS has uh, inbuilt uh, protection, amplification, and there are other features which uh, hardens the whole module. Uh, compared to a normal GPS, that uh, the commercially of, uh, available off the shelf GPS that we were using, uh, it, it detects three times as many satellites as you'll get with uh, a single channel or a L1 uh, GPS. So having this, we, we had completed our uh, hardware suit. So we have the motor controllers, we have the flight controller, and we have the GPS. So now we can uh, control the motors via the flight controller and know where we have to place the drone in the sky using the GPS. Now. The next challenge was to enhance the accuracy of a GPS. So how this works is that you have an RTK system, you have a base station on the ground, you uh, collect data, you basically do a survey uh, for about 24 hours or so, and uh, you you get a fix, you get a localization solution off of uh, that data. Now, every subsequent data, you can use that to correct your position. So a normal GPS on a good day will give you around two to five meters of accuracy, whereas our GPS, when it's getting these corrections, can place itself within 10 centimeters of the designated spot. 
so your accuracy is increased 50 times uh, when uh, the system is operating yeah. along with that we have done a lot of spectrum analysis so for any site let, uh, even for rashtrapati bhavan we had de deployed spectrum analysis so you uh, so you know that you are the only one who's transmitting uh, at a certain band and also that you are not interfering with anybody else's transmissions once the hardware was sorted out we then moved on to the software part now the controls was uh, there but a drone has to be at a certain spot and it has to display a certain color for us to make a picture be it 2d or 3d so we have written a lot of uh, code uh, for these 3d engines we uh, we use all sort of animation softwares and we have this uh, script which uh, translates an image or a 3d object into a point cloud uh, which is then uh, used to uh, generate the flight trajectories for the drones so this is an example of uh, the kind of formations this, this is a old example where we are using only 50 to 60 drones uh, but this is a good proof of concept and uh, this is where we realize that uh, we'll have to use uh, clusters to generate the flight trajectories for a system after the flight trajectories are generated uh, we have uh, uh, the simulation software so we basically simulate uh, as if all of these drones or uh, all of these objects are flying together and then we check for collisions because transitioning from one formation to the other uh they will uh, be assigned a certain path and if their path uh, is such that two of the drones or three of the drones are coming to within a certain threshold distance that is detected in the simulation so even before we put hardware on the ground we conduct any test flight this is uh, the simulator that tells us that see uh, you might have a problem of these couple of drones running into each other and then we can go back in the animation and then fix the animation so with that i'm um, uh, i will conclude uh, i'm leaving you with uh, a visual of about 90 drones uh, from 8 months ago uh, landing and if you if any of you have any questions i'll be happy to answer hey thank you very much uh, tanmay uh, this was it was really exciting right so a startup from the scratch and uh, you said like you know you could able to do everything on your own house right so i have a question on the window so was the microcontroller for the fight controller is also designed or parts of such microcontroller uh, were off the shelf so the question so, is uh, have you designed microcontroller yeah so we have not designed the microcontroller we are using a off the shelf microcontroller as of now uh, we are working on a risk 5 controller so we have hmm. a soft core running on our uh, on fpga uh, simulating uh, or emulating a risc 5 architecture and once that is done we hope to move on to making our own silicon in the next 2 to 3 years so oh, that's fantastic that's so great to hear so um uh, just for the interest of time i want to put a broader question right so the one of the greatest problems that every startup this has is a cost optimization solution right and one such way that you guys have really proved on the table is how do we bring in home grown solutions right so come on the board so would you uh, probably give a little couple of sense if i have to ask you give an uh, an suggestion or an advice for an upcoming start startup right how do you really look at this problems how you have solved it so that what they can learn from it for their own startups yeah so see there are a lot of development boards available for you to start with but don't uh, be stuck there uh, there are very basic tools that if you don't have you have to work with someone to uh, get that skill on board so for us uh, the case was that we knew how controls work we knew how these algorithms are written but we needed a particular set of hardware to run those algorithms so we developed that uh, technology or the know how not the technology itself but the know how in house so we know that this is uh, my task at hand this is the hardware that is needed to address that particular problem set and these are the suppliers or the key partners that will help me in building that hardware just mm -hmm. a small add on to that point is that we designed everything and once our hardware was qualified we realized that the semiconductors were just not available mm -hmm. so because we had that know how in house 
we were really quickly were able to uh, design a workable solution in a matter of weeks mm. and a workable solution with the parts that were available in the market mm. so having that know how is very difficult uh, is not very difficult but it's very very crucial because it mm. lends you the flexibility of changing your hardware on the fly and then qualifying it in a very small span of time Right. I completely agree with you. I think if you don't have this capability, bring on those talents on board and yep. build that know-how is the key piece of it. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tanmay. I uh, really appreciate for being here and sharing your experience with uh, you know our research community, and much appreciate. Right. So with that note, um, you know uh, uh, it's an honor to kind of introduce Simioc Technology Private Limited, another very exciting uh, you know uh, startup. right so the simio uh, fundamentally works on electro magnetic interference that's emi and the emc right so that those are the ones which contributes to a significant percentage of compliance failures for all the electronic and the electrical hardware verification that critically leads to loss of revenue by delay i mean delay to the uh, market right and very worst case is like there could be cancelled projects So Simio had came up with their flagship product, which is called as Compliance Scope. Fundamentally, like uh, the Compliance Scope reduces this risk by evaluating it much early in the stage, right? So uh, they have uh, come up with two broad technological breakthroughs, right? So one is physics-based uh, the hybrid electronic mic- uh, electromagnetic solvers and the database models. So they'll be talking about that in their talk. With, uh, before which uh, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce Sir Deepanjan. Deepanjan is an uh, associate professor in electrical communication engineering at IAS Bangalore. He's also founder and the CEO at Simyog Technologies Private Limited, a spin-off from IASC, focused on agile for hardware design. His research interest includes computational electromagnetics with application in signal integrity. power integrity emi for high speed chip package systems and high performance computing dr kope is founding member at nimbic right which was acquired by metrographics later where he served as an vice president r and d from 2007 to 2011 and 2013 to 2014 between 2005 yes. and 2007 he was a yeah. senior cad engineer at yeah. intel He has more than eighty journals and conference publications, and he received his PhD and master's degree from electri- in electrical engineering from University of Washington. Right. With that introduction, over to you, uh, Mr. Deepajit, and the uh, stage is all yours. Thank you so much, Mr. Dhanapati, and uh, the organizing committee of uh, VLSIB, and uh, it is my pleasure uh, and honor to share the stage with Neha Akansha Tanme. Uh, awesome, uh, you know, uh, work there. um today i want to talk about uh, you know simyog and the uh, the work that we are doing at simyog i'll share my uh, screen so uh, we are we are start we started in 2017 our offices are in bangalore and now we have an office in us austin as well it's a spin off from indian institute of science uh, bosch and idea spring are the investors seed stage investors um what we do um, the mission of the company is agile for hardware in in a nutshell you you know you saw the other uh, startups here um we basically would love to champion their cause in terms of helping in the design right in the design flow we provide tools and simulation uh, simulation tools that would help in in coming up with the hardware um to give you another example if you look at the semiconductor company there are a lot of tools that are available um to in order to design the correct semiconductor so that when after the tape out there are no surprises if you look at you know if you look back like 10 years um and if you look at systems you saw the drones you can see automotive you can see other systems as well the electronics and electrical part of such systems is increasing very rapidly so you know to me for example you know future generation car or a drone is like a next generation printed circuit board su- such as the amount of electronics in them and because these are new concepts right this i mean 10 year old concepts of bringing in so much electronics into a system like this um, the way of designing this is also going through a uh, change and uh, i'll talk about one such change which is uh, 
the electromagnetic compatibility part of it, right? If you look at the automotive industry, and you're all familiar with the trends, electrified, automated, connected, and shared, what it means is that, you know, a lot of electronics is being packed together in close proximity, and which increases uh, the chances of them interfering with each other, right? Uh, this is uh, the noise generated by each one of these components can affect and and hurt the performance of the others, right? That's the, the challenge problem is called electromagnetic compatibility. Now, if you look at automotive, you know, if you look at the power electronics section growing at a very high CAGR, uh, power electronics is one of the um, key, uh, you know, sort of components that cause these emissions. And if you look at the other parts, which is like ADAS and others, which are dominated by sensors, these are very susceptible to these kind of emissions. And, uh, and so the, the importance of making sure that these components pass electromagnetic compatibility first time around is very critical. So how does this work, right? Typically, you can look at at least the automotive industry in three different sections. Um, there's a semiconductor vendor uh, who provides the ICs, and then there are hardware uh, component makers who take these ICs and make the systems or PCBs. And then they go and sit in a system like a car, right? The EMC problem is affecting each one of them, uh, starting with the OEM, where this is a safety critical issue. So for example, if you look at a dashboard of a car, right, uh, let's say it's a capacitive touch sensor dashboard, you know, you don't want that to malfunction at all, right? And, and that might cause safety critical issues in, uh, in, in during the uh, field trials and other use. Um, on the tier one side, um, the way the industry runs today is that the OEMs, uh, you know, explicitly tells the tier one provider that, you know, go to the EMC laboratory, make sure you inject some noise and, and, and make sure your equipment still performs well, right? And, and what is happening today is as much as half or 50% of uh, such tests are failing the first time around, leading to six to 12 months of delay, right? So this is a cause for concern for pretty much all through the segments, uh, starting from OEM tier one and semiconductor. Um, and to explain this problem further, right? If you look at uh, what is done today, most of the time this is handled in the, uh, in the, in the physical stage, right? Once you have a hardware, only then you can take it to a laboratory and can test it in, in a physical laboratory, right? Uh, and the hardware is available only at the late stage of the design cycle. And so what we have designed is a tool called Compliance Scope, which uh, enables the designer to test it out in the early design stage. Uh, when you test it out in the early design stage, you have more um, ways of fixing the problem. The cost of fixing is much less. Uh, you know, you don't have to cancel projects at the very end. You don't have to change um, the layout or go for a redesign or, or, or just, you know, uh, basically avoiding delay in time to market. So that's what we bring to the table. Uh, so our mission is basically uh, a virtual EMIMC laboratory where you can do such tests with the design files rather than the actual hardware and um, showing some diagnosis uh, which the designers can then use to, to reduce the emissions and then, uh, you know, of course, design for EMC, which is a concept of starting EMC uh, or thinking about EMC right from the design stage, right? And as uh, Dhana mentioned, I think we, our technology is based on two primary pillars. One is the physical science-based part, which is basically computational circuits, computational electromagnetics, uh, where we solve, you know, very arbitrary shaped complex structures. And what we've been able to mix with that is a data science based model, which is, um, you know, if, if you look at the antennas, if you look at the LIS, since they repeat, um, you know, you can change your design under test, but these became, remain the same. So we have built models for them. Further, some of these IC models that are, uh, you know, that are critical for such EMC simulation, are, are you know are missing right now so we develop them using machine learning once you have these two things combined the data science and the physical science combined you can actually predict the current density or or you know how it's going to behave on the lab and can get the results accordingly right so um, you know how good is the tool well you know you, you should look at how well it matches with the measurement data so here is one example of a conducted emission test of a dc dc converter uh, and the gray line is the measurement and the black line is the simulation. Our aim is to be within 6 dB of, uh, of the measurement uh, results because lab to lab variation is also around 6 dB. So these are some of our customers, TI, Texas Instruments, Dallas, Cypress, Bangalore, Microchip, Phoenix, ST Micro um, in Italy, Bosch, 
from Bangalore, Panasonic, Denso, Fujitsu from Japan, and, and some of the other companies. We are also working with uh, Mercedes-Benz on, on the next generation vehicle level simulation. Um, this is our revenue profile, our product roadmap. Uh, you know, we have, as we talked about, we want to offer this on the cloud. The cloud brings in an interesting concept, right? One machine, 10 hours, 10 machine, one hour, today costs the same. So if you have a you know, very well parallelized code, then you are actually able to give the results, let's say, 10x faster. Uh, you can think about what, what was happening in a day can happen in an hour. And that would help uh, uh, you know, the users of such tools a lot. Uh, this is uh, our management team. We have uh, you know, a mix of uh, experience and, and youth uh, in, in the team. Uh, this is some of the awards that we have received recently. We got this. Uh, we are very honored to get the Emerge 50 award from, from NASCOM. And uh, you know, our next our journey continues. And we would want right now, we are primarily in the automotive sector, but we would try to uh, you know, make our tools available in aerospace, IT com, and industrial sector as well very soon. Uh, I think with that, I will uh, uh, finish my uh, conversation or finish my presentation and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Deepanjan. It was really a uh, very good presentation. And in fact, I do agree to um, you know your, your statements that the, the EMA compliance is the topmost priority in any of the product lines, right? So the, the first question uh, that um, you know I have for you is that you've been talking about and um, you know the vehicle EMA compliance and EMC compliance, right? So now uh, you know probably like uh, the startups which are probably near the, the consumer space of things. And uh, we see a lot of innovation which has been coming uh, along the way. And there are startups in the communication side of things as well. Can you just throw a little more light in terms of um, what are the importance right, uh, of the EMA compliances in those ecosystems as well? And what the startups has to do uh, right, to, to make sure that when they come up with the product, those are all meeting those, uh, you know, the quality standards. Because if you don't meet a quality standards, uh, you cannot really sell it out. Right? Can you throw some light in the other segments and what they have to do in their designing phase? Absolutely. Right. I think, uh, you know, nowadays in, in, in the local ecosystem, we see a lot of medical uh, eco electronics companies. And uh, not only that, we see, you know, uh, our esteemed colleagues here, right, uh, Tanmay's company and, uh, you know, uh, and Neha's company, right? So they are in different segments. But yes, if you want to sell your components, uh, specifically, like if you're selling your components to an OEM, they would require uh, some amount of EMC compliance. And then if you want to sell in Europe and, and US, the government would require some FCC or CE standardization. So, uh, you know, I would, you know, definitely encourage them to look at EMC at a, at a relatively early stage. The challenge of looking at it at the late stage, what I find from my interaction with, uh, you know, with my users is that, you know, at a late stage, you know, you're, you may not be able to redesign as much as, as necessary to actually get this EMC into mind. So I would say, you know, before your sample A is generated, right, have an idea of the EMC compliance and, you know, if, you know, we are, of course, scaling up in terms of the kind of devices that we can support, we'll be happy to, you know, chat with you. And in particular for startups, we'll obviously want to uh, work with them much closer. Okay, great, great. So I have a technical question. So your uh, innovation is around your softwares, right? And you were also talking about in data models. One of the greatest challenge when you do is, is like, you know, of course, you need to be fast enough, but you need to have an accurate enough as well. Because your accuracy and, um, you know, the speed of your simulation should go hand in hand. So I see there is a lot of opportunities and we were talking about you know, the track as well to create and such sort of an, a simulation end to end, right? So from your SOC to your platform um, to the real work models, right, to optimize it. There is a lot of things coming along the way. So uh, for the budding entrepreneurs or maybe the researchers, right? So uh, how do you really, um, you know, come up with such uh, a model? And how do you have to measure against? Can you give some of the tips and tricks uh, for yeah. them in terms of uh, in those lines? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question, right? I think, you know, I mean, data science is a new word, right? I mean, so to say, you know, last five years. But we have been practicing uh, macro modeling, you know, right when I was a student, right? Uh, if you think about it, if you look at large systems, right? The system maker does not, 
you know, need to understand the device physics. The way we engineers have done this is that we make models at every stage, device models, then transistor models, then gate level models, cell level models. So this is not new for our industry. This is something that's been ongoing for, for quite a while, right? Now, the ability perhaps with the advances in data sciences, perhaps you have you know, a little more tools, uh, you know, some more tools in order to create these models at, at that stage. So this accuracy versus speed is always a challenge for the designers. Early on in the design cycle, perhaps you don't need that much accuracy. You can start with, uh, you know, an approximate simulation where the value of models even is higher, right? When you go, you know, towards the verification stage, perhaps, you know, you have to go a little bit deeper in terms of like, you know, more accurate models of the devices and so on. So, yeah, I think, you know, it's it, there are levels of these models and up to the researcher to choose. Um, to, more and more tools are getting available uh, these days. Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for the Thank insightfulness. You. I think this is in uh, you know the the data science is in need of an hour in every um, you know the industry or the work that we do that kind of nicely leads to our next uh, uh, the the innovation and the startup the six sense AI six sense AI is an industry layer platform that helps manufacture scan millions of images at a high speed and identify the defects automatically at the scale using their own patentable AI product which is called as in classify AI. They platform, uh, they do end-to-end -end journey of setting up and visually running a 24 bar 7 and maintaining a over the time for the sustained accuracy using class, you know, classify a, a user can upload uh, and intelligently label the data and able to train uh, the contextual a models and monitor and debug for performance and deploy their and run a in production, right? So this platforms uh, have been uh, widely available. I mean, uniquely designed for the manufacturing uh, engineers to able to set it up uh, a for visual inspection on their images from any tool, importantly any product or the process in less than six hours. Amazing, right? So with that, uh, it's my honor and pleasure to introduce Kancha. She's a co-founder and the CEO at uh, Six Sense. Right, a Singapore-based tea technology company, where um, you know the Six Sense AI platform augments design making in the manufacturing quality at multi-billion-dollar semiconductor manufacturers right, such as Global Foundries and uh, Infineon. She's an IIT alumnus, and she conducted research at a, a star IASC and uh, uh, you know Washington University in St. Louis. She so started her career as a software engineer at. Altair Engineering, automating manufacturing process of Hyundai uh, Motors and General Electric. The dreams to build her own startup. She hustled at Pisa Hut and led uh, the digital product design teams at two million dollar startup before starting uh, Six Sense. With an inspiring introduction, the stage is all yours, Akansa. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, I'm Akansha, co-founder and CEO at Six Sense. We are building an AI platform that helps manufacturers reduce the cost of quality through defect classification. Visual quality inspection is one of the most critical processes to control the cost of quality. In a 24-7 production line, visual checks happen, so no defect escapes and increases the cost of quality exponentially. Today, inspections have a very high error rate of up to 40%, and the manufacturers do it in two ways. They have a team of operators uh, who end up making a lot of mistakes due to fatigue in locating and classifying defects in millions of images every day. For a few processes, engineers automate inspections using rule-based algorithms, but they fail to scale and adapt to a broader catalog with subtle variations between defect classes. This leads to either defects getting missed or over rejections of certain products. Such inaccurate inspections cost millions of dollars to a manufacturing company for four key reasons. Manual labor cost, they invest half a million to a few million dollars in manual operations team. Delay to identify adds to scrap and rework. Many customers are losing millions of dollars due to rejects and field recalls are 10x more expensive. Sixth Sense has addressed this problem and built an industrial AI platform for accurate defect classification. How we do it? Sixth Sense integrates with existing image capture tools, analyzes 
uh, at a very high speed of 16 million images per minute per GPU that we install the software to. Uh, classifies defects into different categories. AI also monitors and maintains itself and ultimately writes back the class codes of defects for lot disposition decisions to the real time manufacturing flow. Single solution is possible to apply to a variety of data sets that comes from various sites a manufacturing company has different types of inspection tools that they use for different products and processes. Our software today is able to take any kind of image data, be it optical, SEM, X-ray, ADX, and analyze it for accurate defect classification. Let's watch Classify AI in action. Building an AI platform for visual inspection. Using Classify AI, manufacturers can automate defect identification for millions of images. Applying AI for visual inspection consists of four simple steps. Label data, train model, test performance, and deploy model to production. Let's see how Classify AI is unique at each step of the process. You can upload and label large volumes of data in a matter of seconds. You can also ask for AI suggestions and label data in just a few clicks. The platform comes with pre-trained models specialized for defect identification. As you tell us more about your data, the pre-trained models get automatically tuned to your dataset. You can thus train highly accurate models with just a few clicks. Sixense models boast high accuracies of up to 98%. Once a model is trained, you can drill down into its performance and debug where it's making mistakes. Built-in explainable AI also explains each decision made by AI for more transparency. In many cases, AI takes multiple views of a defect into account to make a classification decision, boosting accuracies by up to 30%. Models with high performance are instantly deployed to production. Engineers can track ROI over time, such as automation rate, yield loss across processes, and yield recovery on using AI. Classify separates out new defects and quickly adapts to them. This makes sure AI accuracy is maintained even when defects evolve. Data drifts are automatically flagged, indicating a need to audit and update AI. With Classify AI, you can trust that your visual inspection system is in safe hands every second. Six cents. By engineers for engineers. That was classic AI. So alternatives do exist to such solutions, but either they don't scale or aren't accurate for such complex needs. And there are many ways in which we are different from the existing solutions. Most AI softwares use single image for classification. We offer human based or defect classification where a defect is classified by looking at many angles and not a single image, boasting accuracies by up to 30%. Secondly, most AI companies start with 100% automation and the drawback is manufacturers don't know when there is a new defect. We take a more practical approach where we identify the presence of a defect and send it for manual classification and retraining. Next is explainability. Most AI systems today are known to be a black box. We build transparency by explaining each decision of AI to the user for trust. Manufacturing leaders have been mentioning about our technology at various conferences. General managers of global foundries spoke about how our product has proven a huge variety of data from their factories. Executive Vice President at Infineon shared how Classify has improved yield gain and cycle time at their company. With these validations, thank you so much for your time and patience. We are currently raising our next round of investment and expanding our teams. So if you're interested for further discussions, I'm happy to uh, connecting with my team and ourselves. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much, Kancha. So the A is the buzzword everywhere, right? And uh, you uh, write so solving the, the hardest problem of se semiconductors with the A, A is truly inspiring, right? So I have a um, you know, question for you. 
So you you run a classifier engine to um, you know figure out whether the defective part or a non-defective part, right? So I have a couple of questions associated to it. What is your RMSC value? And secondly, do you also deploy this reinforcement learning so that you know uh, it automatically learns out of its mistakes that it makes? Can you throw some light about uh, you know the solution that you have made? So um, thank you for the question. We currently are using deep learning algorithms uh, to automate the processes where uh, there are inbuilt algorithms to understand when there is a new defect. And we wait for manufacturing engineers feedback to understand if this is a new defect or this was a variation of an existing defect category. And that's how the feedback loop continues to keep automating and self-learn the AI from automation point of view. Okay, I see, I see. So I have an um, generic question. Uh, there is a lot of industry as to have been doing the research on the AI and developing in product around it, right? The recent times, um, we are keep hearing about explainable AI and responsible AI. So I believe those are very important factors for any of the AI startups is concerned, right? Uh, you being successful uh, startup and uh, practicing those things, can you throw some of a light of uh, what an upcoming startup has to think through, just not only in solution, something to do about the responsibility, about uh, the power that they have, uh, right? So not to misuse. Can you throw some light uh, for the startups in the upcoming researchers, please? Sure. I think uh, the whole world of uh, responsible and explainability is uh, pretty new, where there are basic algorithms being developed today to understand how do we explain it. But there is a lot of scope to be able to uh, develop the products of its own that uh, just focuses on making sure that the AI results are compliant enough to the end customer's quality, because ultimately the decisions that we make are uh, going to be used by manufacturers to help their end customers understand the quality of products. And we don't want to live in a world where quality of products are always compromised. So it's a very important area to be uh, focused from research expansion point of view as well.